In the pre-dawn darkness of August 26, 1929, in the back bedroom of a small house in Torrance, California, a 12-year-old boy sat up in bed listening. So the bell jar idea is about um, how we as individuals only know what we have experience with. And so that um, if we try to step outside of that, how do we step outside of that? How do we get outside of that? Is there any way that we can move beyond the current knowledge of our life to become bigger or different or does the bell jar, the glass of the bell jar, contain us so that we can see what's outside through the, the pane of glass, but we, we're separated because the glass creates a barrier for us there. And then if we think about a bell, bell jar is shaped kind of like a bell, then it's not only just a clear glass barrier, but it's a, a distorted barrier. So my thought process kind of started with the boys and girls of, of the club that I work with and trying to figure out how to make them understand that the world is bigger for them than just the neighborhood that they grow up in. How do we get something in their brains that says to them, I can be different than what I am now, when all they see is what they are now, under, from under their own bell jar. And then I realized that all the work that I was doing kind of is about that, about my own perspective or the perspective of whoever I happen to be depicting that's a limited perspective um, and maybe not limited in terms of understanding but limited in terms of applicability. I may know something exists but unless I can apply it to my life it's an abstract thing for me. It's outside my bell jar. I can see it, I know it's there but I'm not applying it. So that's why I thought about this work in terms of using the bell jar as an analogy. I am all the time asked um, what kind of medium I have, what kind of medium I use, and um, I never know whether to say I'm a drawer or a painter or a sculptor because I kind of do them all. So I think of myself more as a materials person rather than a drawer or a painter. And what's fun about that is, is that I can manipulate the drawing materials to be more painterly and I can manipulate the paint to be more like a drawing material. So for instance, when I um, make a mark with graphite, I can use a white translucent paint or, or liquid to kind of pull that graphite into a softer focus, but not cover it up. So in that way, it's kind of left a history. Uh, I can leave a history of the mark making by not totally covering it up, but then I can create a whole new mark on top so that the image itself is not defined by the first mark I made, but rather the last mark, but you can see the histories of that. Um, and I like to add other materials to things that I find, things that I think just work with the piece. I've got a couple pieces where I found stuff when I'm riding my bike, and I just never really know where I'm gonna use it or how I'm, in, I'm gonna use it, but I know someday I will use it. So I just keep it, and then all of a sudden I think, well, that's gonna work great for that. So it's not like I predefine my materials my, and then make the piece. I start making the piece and let it suggest the materials to me. This is my brother, this is my sister, and that's myself. Um, but my father died when I was six. So this, this is an early portrait of them, probably when I was about this age, maybe a little younger than this. And um, as I realized the layers of the fabric, I didn't really care which fabrics I used. I just wanted them to be a certain layer of translucency. So um, that's how I chose the fabrics. But I, I realized that I wanted my father to be on the lower layer because he wasn't a part of my life growing up. He was just there at the beginning. So I wanted her, my mother, to be on the top layer because that's where she was throughout my entire life. And I, I put the zipper between them, and, and that's, what I, that's how I placed all of the zippers and the buttons for a reason, because they were split early on because I was six when he died. So that made a split there. 
And then my mom married a farmer who was a, a grain farmer. So that's why all the corn, all the, the memories of my early, the, the geography of my early life is about being on the farm and the corn and the grain bins and the silos and that kind of thing. Um, and so because we made a split, they made the split, then I always felt like my siblings and I were isolated from the bulk of the family because he, he, my new stepfather came to the family with four children and then there were the three of us and, and so we again kind of made a split from the family unit. So that's why that piece is individual. And then um, I decided to go on like read it as a narrative across from younger to older. So I, I go across this way and this is my brother. This brother right here is this young man right here. And um, I wanted to, to show that his ideals were changed as a person. He's a very gentle person, a very soft person, uh, tender. But as he grew up, because he was thrown into this other environment, because of all of these splits, he had to um, project a machismo that wasn't natural for him. And so he has this gun. He's holding this gun and, and in this very kind of machismo pose. And I, and I found the juxtaposition of my little brother right here. Very interesting because he's 12 years younger than I am and he's standing next to my older brother with the gun and he's got a pencil holding it in the same pose as the gun. So he is emulating the same kind of machismo and as it turns out in adulthood he's not like that either. So they were, they were playing at a role because they thought that that's how they were supposed to be and that wasn't a natural role for them. And so if you read this narratively across these little guys fit in here because this is a bride and a groom and a dog, typical family union. But if you notice, the pebbles are dropping down on the head of the child. And so the, the, the kid's getting pelted with rocks. Um, and so that's kind of this area of this, this childhood, this life. And then over here, I put the cage because the open door of the cage um, maybe indicates freedom. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's what bell jars do to you. <laughs> so this one right here is me as an adult. And I'm kind of reflecting, looking back um, at the base of the... I can't even do it anymore. a really weird reaction. <laughs> uh, because I live in my space, my studio is my living room. I have a bedroom, a kitchen, and then what normally people would have for a dining room or a living room is my studio. And I like it that way because I drink my coffee making art, I go to bed making art, I am just constantly walking by the thing and reassessing and in the middle of my shower and getting dressed, I um, stop and use the pencils on whatever I'm walking by. And uh, I, for me, if I see it all the time, then I can make good judgments on it um, because I'm living with it. And it's not, my mindset isn't making art, but more just the life of the piece, how it works with mine. But when you talked about rituals, I didn't think I had any. And then I realized I do have some. And I'm flashing my scissors around. This sweater is one. <laughs> it's really kind of a funny old sweater. The friend who gave it to me called it an old man sweater, and that's why he didn't want it, because he didn't want anybody to think he was an old man. And he was kind of an old man at the time. But um, I call it my art sweater. So whenever it's cold, I hang it on the doorknob into my bedroom. And that's where my studio starts, and my bedroom ends. And I just put it on the minute I come out and start working on the art. I don't want to direct my audience's views into to thinking one thing or another. I want them to bring what they bring to the table and maybe take away a little bit of what I, what I brought, um, but feel something, um, whether they hate it or they like it. A strong emotion is, is what I'm looking for. 
the ambivalence that people sometimes have. I see people walk into galleries and maybe they don't even look at the work or they don't care. You know, they just breeze right by and spend two seconds on each piece. That bothers me because we put our lives into this stuff. And um, if they bother to come to the gallery, I would like them to care. Um, and I, like I said, I don't care if it's good or bad, if it's hate or love. I just want them to feel something about it. Um, and so that feeling needs to be theirs, not mine. Um, that I give them a little something to take away with is, is a nice thing to think about, but that they bring to it as much as they take away is as important to me. Thank you.